Bonjour. Let's explore a standard setup for a 4-bit binary counter. This counter will be asynchronous, which, as we've mentioned, means that the flip-flops are not connected to a common clock, which will lead to glitches. In this schematic, see how the clock feeds into the first flip-flop, but no others. All downstream flip-flops must wait for the upstream flip-flops to change before they can be instructed to change. The top flip-flop, which the clock is connected to, will be changing most frequently, and thus is the least significant bit. The bottom flip-flop represents the most significant bit. In total, this counter has four bits, which means it can count from binary 0000 to 1111, or decimal 0 to 15. The current number shown is 1100, or decimal 12. Remember to read bottom to top. At any point in time, this counter can be manually reset to 0000 by flipping the asynchronous clear switch. I said that the flip-flops will be changing, but in what manner? To answer this, start by identifying the mode that each flip-flop is in. It turns out that all of them are in toggle mode, due to this high signal passed in to each of the T instruction inputs. Does this mean that every flip-flop will toggle on every clock pulse? Well, yes and no. If you mean every system clock pulse, the answer is no. That system clock passes into only the top flip-flop, so that one does toggle on every system clock pulse. Each other flip-flop toggles on a clock pulse from its own perspective. This port is not required to have a true system clock feeding into it. Any signal is possible. Because of the bubble, this port means that a negative pulse, or a drop from high to low, is what enables the flip-flop to change. That negative pulse could be occurring in regular intervals, such as from a true clock, or it could even be controlled by a manual switch. So, by this schematic, the second flip-flop will be enabled to change, and thus toggle, when the least significant bit drops from high to low. The third flip-flop will toggle when the prior flip-flop drops from high to low. And similarly, the fourth flip-flop will toggle when the prior flip-flop drops from high to low. But why? Because this is how a binary count works. Look at this table. Q0 toggles between every single row, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. That's why this top flip-flop toggles on every single clock cycle. Q1 toggles every two rows. That's true, but we can be even more specific. Q1 toggles whenever Q0 drops from high to low. Notice here how Q0 drops high to low, and correspondingly, Q1 toggles. Again, we see here that Q0 drops high to low, and Q1 toggles. That's why this Q1 flip-flop will toggle when it senses a negative pulse from the Q0 flip-flop. Q2 toggles every four rows, and it always corresponds with Q1 dropping high to low. Notice that pattern here, and again down here. We don't even need to consider the behavior of the other bits. The behavior of Q1 dictates exactly when Q2 should change. Naturally, that's why this Q2 flip-flop toggles after a negative pulse from the Q1 flip-flop. And the pattern continues one last time. Q3 toggles only after Q2 drops high to low. We can see this pattern in the table, and also in the schematic. Pretty elegant pattern, huh? We could extend this as far down as we want, if we want to count higher than 15. The key thing is to use negative edge triggered flip-flops. But there's the classic asynchronous problem, glitches. Let's illustrate this with the worst case scenario the jump from 7 to 8. At decimal 7, these binary values would read 0, 1, 1, 1. Then, on the next clock cycle, Q0 toggles like it always does. This 1 changes to 0, and for a brief moment, the count reads 0, 1, 1, 0, or decimal 6. That drop from 1 to 0 triggers the next flip-flop, 
which in turn toggles from 1 to 0. Now, briefly, the count reads 0, 1, 0, 0. That negative pulse causes the next flip-flop to toggle, and the count reads 0, 0, 0, 0. Finally, that negative pulse causes the most significant bit to toggle up to 1, and we reach the correct count of 1, 0, 0, 0. Phew, that took a while to explain. If we assume a 50 nanosecond delay through each flip-flop, however, that total period with an incorrect output would only be 200 nanoseconds. This would be completely unnoticeable to human senses. For example, if we were using this counter to flash lights in a specific sequence, we would never see the glitches. However, this may cause issues within a computer. To illustrate, let's observe this counter in the simulator. I've currently set each flip-flop to a delay of 50 nanoseconds and the clock to a period of 400 nanoseconds. Notice how, when the count changes from an even number, like 6 to 7, there is no glitch. Why? Because only that least significant bit needs to change. There are not multiple bits changing in a cascade. But notice how when the count changes from an odd number, like 7 to 8, there are a number of glitches. When the count settles on the correct number, it holds it for the longest period of time. If we want the correct count to display for a larger portion of each clock cycle, we must increase the period of the clock, like I'm doing here. The length of the glitch period is fixed by the delays through each flip-flop. The flexibility we have is with the clock period, and thus the clock frequency. So, the first big internal consideration is that the total propagation delay helps determine the minimum clock period, or the maximum clock frequency. If we expand the schematic to 5 bits, or 8 bits, or 16 bits, the clock must work slower and slower. This would reduce the overall processing speed of the computer. The second big consideration is whether those glitches will cause incorrect operations. Let's say this counter is used to control when data is saved, and that data saving operation will occur whenever the counter outputs 0000. This would be trouble, because the sequence 0000 appears occasionally during glitch periods. So the operation could be triggered at the wrong times, and the wrong data would be saved. So how can we manage glitches? One simple approach is called strobing, and you can see it implemented here. Look at this output display. It follows the correct count, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, with no incorrect numbers in between. But there are X's in between each count. These X's are the result of this tri-state buffer and represent high impedance states. If you recall from an earlier lesson, High impedance means that there is no electrical signal on this wire, neither a zero nor a one. In many applications, it is preferable to cycle between correct signal, no signal, correct signal, no signal, rather than having a longer correct period, but glitches between the brief transitions. How does this layout work? Let's go back to the slides for the explanation. We start with the same 4-bit asynchronous counter we saw before, but now in device symbol form. We then place a tri-state buffer on its outputs. We connect the clear switch and clock into the counter as needed. And here is the important part. We use the clock to enable the buffer during the appropriate periods. What are the appropriate periods? Recall that this counter is negative edge triggered. so. Right after this clock drops low, all of the transitions occur within the flip-flops and the glitches appear. This means we do not want to read data when the clock is low. So we enable the buffer to output data when the clock is high. This buffer device happens to have an active low enable, so the NOT gate flips that around to active high. If this enable port didn't have the bubble, we could simply wire the clock directly to the port without any gates. 
the results of this layout are summarized in this timing diagram. Every time we see a blue region is when the buffer is disabled, which aligns with all the times when the clock is low. But when the clock is high, the output shows a correct count. In the beginning, the clear switch is activated, and thus we read the sequence 0000. After the switch is deactivated, the next sequence reads 0001. Then, one clock cycle later, after the strobed period, the sequence reads 0010. Next comes 0011, and so on. The basic idea with strobing is that we sit and wait a little before reading the outputs to make sure we get the right values. As one last side note, it is very simple to adapt the 4-bit binary count up into a count down circuit. Here we see the exact same schematic as before, but now with not gates between each flip-flop's output and the next flip-flop's clock port. In practice, those not gates probably would not be used. They represent two different routes to achieve the same thing with features available on flip-flop chips. The first route would be to use the Q prime outputs rather than Q. The second route would be to use positive edge triggered flip-flops rather than negative edge. No matter how you choose to set it up, with four bits, the decimal count would go 0, 15, 14, 13, and so on. Because it is asynchronous, it would still suffer from the glitch issue. In the next video, we'll explore how to build a counter that recycles every 10 clock cycles rather than 16, which will allow us to count in decimal.